So we've got the third part of lab one, and we're going to start with the skull. Now there's going to be a whole lab on the skull, lab six. Uh, this one's going to be sort of abbreviated. We're not going to be looking at a lot of things. The reason we're looking at the skull right now is because the features we're going to talk about either articulate with other bones or a point of contact for muscles that we're going to be studying. So right here, we see these two parts of the skull that sort of look like the runners of a rocking chair. Those are the occipital condyles, part of the occipital bone, and they are going to articulate with the atlas, which is the first of the cervical vertebrae, the superior most cervical vertebrae. Then we're going to see right over here that there's kind of a protrusion, one on each side, and these are the mastoid processes of the temporal bone. And the mastoid process is where the sternocleidomastoid muscle attaches, and they pull on that bone and make a bump. And then we're going to see right here there's a ridge, and here there's a ridge, and then there's one right in the middle. These are the nuchal lines. So we have an inferior nuchal line, a superior nuchal line, and a medial or median nuchal line. And then right here there's a bump, and that's the external occipital protuberance. Now these nuchal lines and the external occipital protuberance are all points of attachment for ligaments that the trapezius muscle attaches to. So we pretty much wrapped up what we're going to study on the skull today, just quickly reviewing. Uh, we have the occipital condyles, we have the mastoid processes, one on either side. We have the super, uh, I'm sorry, inferior and superior nuchal lines and we have the median nuchal line and the external occipital protuberance. These features all attachments for the trapezius muscle. These are attachments for sternocleidomastoid, which we're going to be studying, and this is articulating with the atlas. Okay, so that brings us to the sternum. <clears throat> and um, this is a plastic sternum, uh, but it's a pretty nice model, actually. We can see that the sternum has really three parts. This is the superior end of the sternum, this down here is the inferior end of the sternum. And this big shield-shaped piece is the manubrium right here. There is a joint right here between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. And that is the sternal angle, or angle of Louis. Then we have the body. The body is actually made up of four fused sternobrae. Sternobrae sounds a little bit like vertebrae, but they're for parts of the sternum. So these are really four bones that are all fused together. And this is where the ribs come in and articulate with uh, most of the sternum. Rib two comes in at the sternal angle and rib one attaches to the manubrium. The um, proximal end of the clavicles articulate with the manubrium also. And then this is a xiphoid process down here. And uh, there's a, usually a joint uh, between this and the body. Uh, when you're an infant, this xiphoid would be cartilage and as you get older it becomes bony and it usually fuses. By the way, another name for the body of the sternum is gladiolus. And gladiolus means uh, little sword. So it's supposed to look like a little sword. I suppose if you're drunk enough it does. Okay, now this is not an albino lobster. Um, but oh. here we have the manubrium, the gladiolus of body, the xiphoid process. And you can see these are, represent the costal cartilages coming in and articulating with the manubrium. So here is rib two's costal cartilage here, rib one, and then three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, nine, and 10, the car cartilage all attaches to that of rib seven. So these first seven ribs are true ribs, and then the next three ribs are called false ribs, and the last two ribs, 11 and 12, are floating, and they don't articulate anteriorly. So this gives you a little bit of how the ribs come in and attach to the sternum. Last thing we're going to cover in this lab will be the vertebrae. And uh, here we have uh, three kinds of vertebrae. I'll take them apart and show you. And <clears throat> we'll see that the vertebrae actually uh, get larger as where they proceed inferiorly. And that makes sense if you think about it because uh, they're carrying greater and greater amounts of weight. Um, this is a cervical vertebra, and the cervical vertebra can be distinguished by a couple of characteristics. One is that on either side you see there's a hole in the transverse uh, process. And then posteriorly, instead of having a single spinous process, it's bifid. Not all the cervical vertebrae have a bifid spinous process, bi meaning two, fid, foot, okay? but the uh, cervical does. So bifid spinous process, transverse, 
foramen, the transverse foramen has the vertebral artery and vein going, and the vertebral artery serves the brain, and the spinal cord goes through the foramen magnum here. Okay, we'll go come back and study more detail on these vertebrae in a bit. This is a thoracic vertebra. The thoracic vertebra look like the head of a giraffe. You can see here would be its nose, and there are, are its uh, ears, and it has horns up here. Um, and that's because of that famous movie Thoracic Park with all the giraffes. <laughs> but uh, we have uh, a long pointed spinous process that points inferiorly. We have uh, the transverse processes, instead of going out straight to the side, go kind of like a V. And um, those are the characteristics. Oh, articulations for the thoracic are in a coronal plane. They're sort of like this. And uh, we'll see that the articulations for the cervical vertebrae are in an oblique plane, not coronal, but they're a little bit tipped.